Hello and welcome to the fourth in our series of asynchronous virtual roundtables on transportation, logistics, and supply chain networks under COVID-19. I'm Haniwa Masani, Director of the Northwest University Transportation Center, and I will be your moderator. An asynchronous virtual roundtable is one where the interviews have already taken place, have been integrated into a single roundtable, uh, which will be followed by a live Q&A session. Uh, feel free to ask questions using the uh, Q&A feature of Zoom. So uh, today's uh, roundtable uh, addresses an, a very important topic, uh, namely uh, air cargo and supply chains under COVID-19. We have uh, representatives from three companies with us today. Uh, first, we will have Sean McWhorter, who is president uh, for the Americas uh, of Nippon Air Cargo Airlines, an, air car an all cargo uh, airline. Um, then we'll have Jared Asqui, who is uh, COO of Alliance Ground International, uh, a company that is a um, major, major handler of cargo on the ground uh, before, uh, essentially as it is uh, loaded and uh, unloaded of the, um, um, of the aircraft. And um, uh, then we'll have two representatives from United uh, Airlines, from the cargo side of United Airlines. We'll have uh, Mark Albrecht, who's Director of Cargo Logistics for United, and Helen Christensen, for, uh, who's Managing Director for uh, United Cargo Sales. And with that, we'll uh, start with our uh, first panelist today. All right. So, uh, Sean, you've been with Nippon Cargo Airlines for over 10 years, uh, and you're currently president of the Americas region. You're responsible for all business activities, including sales, marketing, operations, accounting, and um, you've you know you've you've been in this business for 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 many years, obviously, and 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 you've been um, you know you have a good pulse on both um, domestic and international cargo cargo movements. Um, you've seen your share of ups and downs in international trade in the airline industry. Um, how are things different uh, this time? And uh, what are you seeing about economic activity and freight movement from your vantage point? And how much of a reduction in overall activity are you experiencing relative to the same time last year? Sure. Um, obviously, this is so much different because we don't know when it's going to end. This is something that's so much out of our control as to when activity can begin. We were in a good economic cycle. Demand for air freight was very good. Uh, everything was continuing. And we still don't think there's any underlying economic condition that would prevent this from returning once we're able to restart the economy. Um, the uncertainty, obviously, is, is when will that magic time happen? Uh, mm -hmm. For passenger airlines, uh, without people traveling, they obviously couldn't operate. So almost all passenger flights have been suspended, uh, internationally especially, which, mm -hmm. which means that about half of the air freight capacity has been removed from the market. Mm -hmm. um, as an all cargo carrier, what that's done is obviously just increase the demand for our service. Mm -hmm. uh, there's still a huge demand for air freight movement. Uh, our business primarily is Trans-Pacific. It's Asia, US, US, Asia, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of China, a lot of Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan mm -hmm. uh, type business. And that's where a lot of the supplies are coming from that we yep. desperately need in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so with the current situation, without having the passenger belly capacity, that's an integral role of of uh, the transportation supply chain, uh, mm -hmm. it really now relies heavily on the freighter operators, um, of which there's only a limited number of us that operate, and the demand is global. So it's not like we can concentrate on one area. In the past, we had these type issues, whether it was an Ebola, it was limited to Africa. We had different issues, but maybe they were limited to a region. Even things like SARS in the past was limited to Asia. So mm -hmm. when it's limited to one region, one area of the world, it's something we can definitely manage a little better. Mm -hmm. This being a global pandemic, it's, it's creating a situation where resources are being spread so thin 
that we have to make decisions. Where do we, uh, where do we operate? Where do we not operate? Where can we have the best effect and impact and, and positive influence on what's going on? Um, in addition to that, uh, in an effort to protect each country, we saw countries very quickly enact new regulations about who can come in and not. Yeah. And while we certainly understand the need to protect the borders in each country, uh, what they didn't consider was the air freight transportation. And in fact, specifically, the people who fly those aircraft. Uh, yeah. Obviously, we can't fly an aircraft into a country and then put our crews into a 14-day quarantine. It just That's wouldn't right. happen. Mm -hmm. um, so we quickly started trying to work with these countries to say, you know, we need some exceptions made. We need some provisions. If you want us to continue to operate and bring supplies in and out of your country, we need some help on how to handle the flight crews because they're obviously uh, an integral part of our business that uh, there's no way we'd operate if we had to put them into quarantine. Uh, the other thing to realize for a company such as NCA mm -hmm. is our crew members are global. We have South Africans, we have Europeans, we have mm -hmm. South Americans, we have Australians, we have That's Americans, right. we have Canadians. And countries started putting restrictions in place that were specific to the nationality of the crew member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with that, they also said, well, it depends. If you've operated in Italy or if you've operated here, you mm -hmm. must go into quarantine. Well, our crew members are global. They operate everywhere. And it's not just us. It's every freighter operator. Yeah. We're all doing this. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, countries have been accommodating. Um, most times what they've done is once we land, uh, they have special procedures for the crew members that allow them to enter the country, uh, maintain certain safety protocols. We provide private transportation to the hotel. Uh, we agree they don't leave the hotel room. They use uh, room service the whole time they're there, and then they come back out using this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not using public transportation, not leaving, not going to, uh, you know, not going out. So mm -hmm. um, under these type restrictions, we're able to continue to operate. There's a few countries in Asia that still say uh, we won't allow an Italian to come in, for instance. Mm -hmm. So um, in those cases, we simply have to be careful which crew members we assign to which routes. Well, so that's uh -huh. Yeah, so for the most part, we're able to still run the network as long as we apply these special security measures and safety measures. Once they're in the country, they'll allow us to come in and out. Yeah, um, that's, that, that, that sounds like a, like a new constraint and a crew assignment problem. It, it does. We only have so many crew members, and if we can't find one to operate it, um, mm -hmm. so it's just another uh, issue we have to deal with. But we're able to manage that. Um, the other thing we have done, we've adjusted some of our schedules because you know, we have to realize at the end of the day, uh, these crew members are concerned for their own safety and health as well. Of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So some of them are simply saying, I don't want to do this, or I don't want to stay there, or we don't feel safe doing this. And in those cases, we're going to make adjustments for them. We're never going to force them to do something, obviously. Yeah. Um, so for instance, one example, uh, we used to operate Japan, China, US. Mm -hmm. uh, to do that, you have to put, you have to position a crew in China in advance, which means crews had to overnight in China, which the crews are really not wanting to do. So mm -hmm. we just adjusted our schedule. We run Japan, China, Japan on a, what we call a quick turn. The mm -hmm. crew stays on the aircraft. They never leave the aircraft. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. offload, we load, and we bring them right back to Japan. Mm -hmm. And then we fly Japan to US. So okay. we've been able to make some modifications in our schedules in order to accommodate those type of things and still be able to transport the goods that we need to. Um, where we do have some crew limitations, we've had uh, a couple of crew members that were tested positive. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens in that situation is we also have to isolate any crew members that operated with them in an abundance of caution. So they also have to go into quarantine even though they are not exhibiting any, uh, any symptoms, but it then gives us a shortage of crews. So mm -hmm. we suspended our European operations for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. so that we could focus on the Asia-US yeah. trade, which, mm -hmm. was the, which was the bigger demand at the time. Um, while we went through this period, now they're back online, they're back to flying, and, and mm -hmm. uh, we will resume Europe operations next week okay. uh, to help Europe as well. Um, but these are the kind of accommodations and changes we're making in the schedule to operate because with half the capacity being removed, there's, there's a, an enormous amount of pent-up demand for air freight 
yeah. that we're trying to support. Um, I know FEMA in the U.S. here has chartered, I think it was 90 freighter flights. Mm -hmm. They're using UPS, they're using Atlas, they're using the other U.S. freighter operators. Kalita you saw doing flights. Um, those are additional services that are being put in. In addition to things that we run, we run 25 flights a week between Asia and the U.S. So ours mm -hmm. are all full. We've upped it by about four flights a week. So we're trying to max out our capacity mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to give as much possible air freight uh, capacity to our customers that they need, um, but there's still just not enough. There's more stuff coming in than the than the current network can provide. So I was going to ask you, how is that affecting, I guess, your customers in the sense that uh, are are you able to meet? The, you said that you're not able to meet the demand at this point that you're that is coming to you. But what kind of service levels then are you able to provide? How soon are you able to load the cargo that's tended to you? Yeah, so our regular cargo still moves as priority as it did before. Um, the way we basically treat it is our existing customers still have priority on our flights. Uh, you know, they tender, next day it shows up in the U.S. for the U.S. tender, the next day it shows up in Asia. Um, then we have additional customers come on board. We may, we may move them on a three or four day cycle instead of a next day cycle, so a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. um, but we're still able to accommodate much of that demand. Um, one an other area, though, uh, which has been a big challenge, uh, especially uh, here in Chicago, mm -hmm. is the uh, operation on the ground. In addition mm -hmm. to flying the aircraft, mm -hmm. once it lands here, we now have to offload it and we have to run a warehouse operation. That warehouse operation obviously requires people mm -hmm. and the nature of the business makes it very difficult for them to stay separated more than six feet and continue to operate. Yeah. So we know that we're in a little bit of a, uh, a difficult position there. We've had a few uh, employees in Chicago in our warehouse that have been tested positive. Um, so we obviously removed them. We've implemented additional uh, cleaning procedures every night. We've done mm -hmm. additional sanitations of the entire warehouse uh, in order to make sure we keep the place safe. We require masks. We require gloves of all of our agents. So they're trying to do the work. They're continuing to do the work. Uh, under these new safety regulations that the CDC have put out. So um, we're doing everything we can. Um, the other change from our customer standpoint is typically our customers give us cargo and then we break it down mm -hmm. at destination and deliver it loose. Mm -hmm. One of the mm -hmm. things, since we know we have some staffing issues, we simply can't do all that work. We just go to our customers and we say, you have to accept it back intact. You'll mm -hmm. have to do your own breakdown. Yeah. So yeah. customers have been very good about working with us on making accommodations in terms of the workload. So we can still move the goods as an intact unit, but instead of breaking it down to the piece level, which we typically do, we give it back to them as a complete unit and they'll do the breakdown themselves. Mm -hmm. Simply because we don't always have the number of staff available in the warehouse that we'd like to. And that we know so, that so, so you mentioned already that the uh, reduction in, of course, passenger air schedules uh, have taken out about 50% of the typical um, air freight capacity that, that's available. Um, are you finding uh, that um, the, uh, the, the, the passenger airlines are adjusting somehow their schedules um, or to try to accommodate more freight or, or how is that uh, uh, working out? There's been a lot of talk in the news about the different airlines and they've run their passenger aircraft for cargo only. Mm -hmm. And that's okay for an emergency situation. But the truth is the economics of a passenger aircraft never work carrying cargo only. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. right now I'm sure they're charging high rates and 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 it's something that they're gonna do in a short term for emergency situation. It's not a sustainable solution. So that's mm -hmm. an emergency need only. Other than that, until the need for passenger transport comes back, you're not going to see the passenger airlines return. And that obviously depends on the whole uh, business economy when people start flying again. So yeah. although they're doing some specialty flights in specific markets, um, the economics are not there to support a passenger airline running cargo only on their passenger flights. Um, so it's a little bit of a difficult situation. So that's why you see in the ramp up in the freighter operations as much as possible. You're also seeing some of the older aircraft that were really not economic to operate in the past, such as the old 747, uh, what we call the BCF, the passenger mm -hmm. converted 747s. Yep. You're actually seeing people put those back into service now. So those aircraft had been retired or had been parked 
they're now being brought back into service to meet this unmet demand. And that makes more sense. So you'll see people continue to ramp up to the extent they can uh, if they have unused capacity. In our case, we could ramp up, like I said, I think we run three or four additional flights a week. So we went from 22 to about 26 flights a week to the US, mm -hmm. um, just to provide as primarily China to US uh, goods and return. The interesting thing in the return way, um, one of the major commodities that moves by air from the US to Asia are perishables. It's, mm -hmm. it's your fruits and vegetables. Mm -hmm. uh, they come up from South America, they come up from Mexico, they move through the West Coast. It's not a high yielding product. It's a very dense and it works perfect on the passenger aircraft. So mm -hmm. many passenger airlines that operate between the West Coast and Asia, a big part of their air freight is moving perishables. It's yes. tomatoes and lettuce mm -hmm. and avocados and mangoes and broccoli and all these things you wouldn't imagine. They move by air on the lower decks of the passenger flights. Well, without the passenger flights there now, there's mm -hmm. no way to move this food supply into Asia that they rely on. You know, this mm -hmm. is part of this is part of their normal supply chain. This is not an unusual situation. This is if they want fresh fruits and vegetables, they have to be shipped in by air from people who grow them in either South America or Mexico. So without the passenger flights, we're picking up a lot of extra business that we normally wouldn't see, um, which is helping us return the aircraft to Asia and run a uh, run a round trip that makes sense for us. Interesting. So you you already uh, started talking about this, but in terms of the types of, of goods or commodities that are moving and the, the lanes in which they're moving, um, what are you seeing as sort of the sectors that are the most hard hit in this crisis? Uh, and where have there you know have there been new opportunities, uh, particularly in terms of time sensitive demands? Of course, medical. Uh, now you mentioned sure. fruit and vegetables. So can you, you know, what are you seeing in terms of of, of patterns here? Sure. So obviously coming into the U.S. is are, are the protective equipment, the gear, uh, mask, whatever else they can bring in that's manufactured throughout Asia. A lot of that's obviously coming into the U.S. now. Um, otherwise, uh, still some finished goods. We're starting to see China open back up. We saw news that Wuhan has lifted some of its restrictions. Uh, what that means is that their manufacturing is trying to start back up to the extent they can, which mm -hmm. means that they can produce product it'll continue the supply chain of just normal goods coming into the US. Realize that our consumer goods, the way that supply chain works is they're still manufactured in Asia, brought to the US and then uh, consumed here. So with the disruption we've had in the air freight because we've displaced normal goods for, uh, for the protective supplies, now there's getting to be a pent up, backed up demand for normal things that we just like to have in the US. So we're starting to see that come back onto the aircraft as well. Um, mm -hmm. We'll manage that with the protective supplies and the urgent needs, but that's why people like FEMA are chartering their own aircraft in order to bring the goods in. There's just not enough capacity. Mm -hmm. um, out of the US, again, the, the typical things we move, we always move some perishables. Um, a lot of that, as I mentioned, was moved on passenger aircraft without the passenger aircraft being there. We're carrying a lot more of the perishable goods. Um, we also move a lot of capital equipment for manufacturing, so we still see some of that moving out of the U.S., but less. Um, I think the, the areas most hard hit are the automotive sector. We move a lot of automotive by air, and that's mm -hmm. pretty much, we haven't seen much of that at all, because as we've heard, most of the manufacturing in the U.S. has shut down. Uh, the auto manufacturing has suspended. So as long as that's not operating, then that type of goods are not there, which typically would be. Um, but it's being replaced with other things like perishables and protective equipment. What about electronics? We're not seeing as much of that right now. And again, mm -hmm. a lot of the electronics that we see are sub-assemblies within automotive or within mm -hmm. computer okay. um, mm -hmm. or within um, cell phones. Mm -hmm. And we've all seen, you know, Apple may be delaying the release of their next phone. All of that directly impacts the, the air freight supply chain. We move, uh, for, for one of the manufacturers, we move the raw material that's required for the Gorilla Glass that goes into the iPhone. That moves by air. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of product's just not moving right now because they don't want to ship it over by air in an urgent time where it may cost them a premium when they know they're not producing that product in Asia. So we've seen a slowdown in a lot of that type of uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that type of product. So, so you mentioned that there's a there's a rate premium at this point. Uh, uh, what is the magnitude roughly? 
of that premium? I know it varies yeah. by day, by market, et cetera, it, but this it, approximately. Yeah, it, it, and it does. Out of the U.S., for things like perishables, it's still a, about the same rate. That's not one that the, the product itself simply can't afford a premium. Mm -hmm. um, for things that are of an urgent nature, you'll see tw the rate twice as much as it was before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in return for that, they get the overnight type service. They get the quick, quick transit. Uh, what we try to do is for customers who may be more rate sensitive, we simply try to slow down the transit, which means I'll have it sitting around and it'll be a standby product. If I'm not full, I will put that on. So we try to offer customers options. If it's an urgent has to move, you may see your rate at, a, at an express rate, which is about twice what a typical rate would be. Uh, if you say, you know, I have a little more flexibility in the movement, we'll put it as a standby product and we may move it in five or seven days. And in return, you get a lower rate. And that's how we also manage the space on the aircraft to make sure we stay full. So um, are there any particular, you mentioned already the changes in, um, you know, in the, in the schedules and the crew assignment. In terms of the actual cargo handling, uh, are there any particular procedures that you're following um, in order to limit the spread of the disease? And obviously, I guess that would be adding cost, uh, handling and processing time at both origin and destination. But what kind of uh, changes, I guess, uh, are, are, you, are you having to put in place? So we've, uh, we've put a pretty extensive uh, list of requirements in place for our own teams working in the warehouses. You know, we require them to wear masks and gloves all the time. We tell them to maintain six foot separation or more as much as possible. Uh, we go through a process at the beginning of every shift where they wipe down all of their equipment, their forklifts, everything gets wiped down with sanitary wipes. We provide all the sanitary wipes, uh, hand sanitizer, uh, soap so that they can do the hand washing. Um, we're also taking the temperature of every employee that shows up at the facility. And if anybody has a, uh, a fever over, I think it's 99 degrees or 37 Celsius, and we send them back home. So we tell them, don't show up if you're sick. We're going to check your temperature when you arrive just to make sure that we're doing everything possible to recognize uh, any potential issues and stop them as early as we can. Uh, in the case of our Chicago warehouse, we've actually hired a company that does a process called fogging. So they come in once a week, they fog the entire facility. This provides a complete sanitation of the office and warehouse. Uh, that fogging lasts about one week. So every week they come in and they redo it. Uh, in addition, tomorrow we're going to do what we call a deep cleaning at our Chicago facility. We'll go in and we will clean everything that's possible to clean uh, using pressure washers and and uh, disinfectants throughout the floor, the walls, the doors, uh, the poles, the forklifts, the equipment. So we're going to do that in addition to the other measures we're taking. And this is all just extra cost for us, but it, it's just part of doing business. It's something we have to do. Um, so we've committed to our teams. Uh, we're going to keep them safe. We're going to do everything we can. We can operate our business safely if we follow the right procedures. And we've stressed this to our teams. We have posters and signs everywhere telling them what, what we expect them to do. We expect them to use their masks. We expect them to use their gloves. We expect them to keep a separation. We expect them to not share vests or hats or gloves. You know, these are certain uh, things that, that we monitor as well in the operation just to try to keep everybody safe. So we, that's definitely the, the highest priority for us right now because without the staff showing up to work, then there's no reason to fly the aircraft. So it's only possible by us doing our part to keep ourselves safe. Okay, so Sean, just taking a, a little broader perspective here and looking at sort of the overall supply chain, um, where do you see the most critical vul vulnerabilities in both sort of domestic and international supply chains? And I know you work primarily on the international side. Are you concerned more about nodes, terminals, warehouses, air forwarding facilities shutting down because of contamination concerns or labor getting sick or new procedures with, with countries uh, limiting um, access? and requiring uh, quarantining and so on, or more issues with finding carriers for the loads that shippers want to move, or I think, a combination of both. Sure. I think what we're seeing more is, is the people side of it. Um, we have to make sure that we give all the protective services we can to our people to keep them safe and to make sure they feel safe in the environment we have them working in. Um, that, for an air freight operator, that's our most critical piece. Um, there's plenty of demand out there. There's people that want to give us cargo all the time. 
Uh, mm -hmm. We got to make sure it's being handled safely. It's, it's uh, you know, not putting anybody in danger to handle that because as soon as we have something like that happen, if we don't have the people, we can't operate. So that's our most critical, probably our most fragile part of this entire network for us are how to make sure the people are safe. If the, if the pilots, you know, when, when one pilot gets infected and we fly two or three or four crew members on a flight, they're obviously together in the cockpit. Now I have to quarantine four people because one became sick. So preventing that illness is important, which gives them the protective uh, equipment, doing the sanitation procedures, um, instructing them on how to properly handle themselves, avoiding outside contact when they're traveling, staying in their hotel rooms. These are all the components that are really important. Um, in addition to help keep the critical operating staff safe, we pretty much told every other staff in the operation, stay home and work from home. So we gave everybody laptops, they got VPN access to our network now. So if you don't have to be there, stay home. And that way, those that have to work in the operation have fewer points of contamination or at least possible contamination that could happen. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's a, it's a multifaceted effort that we have to take. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just one thing, but it's all centered around the safety of our people. Apart from that, we can manage the rest of it. But if we don't have a safe operation that people want to come to work and willing to come to work, then none of it will work. So as a cargo airline that provides, you know, exceptional service to your customers, um, how do you, and of course you, you must be also experiencing a lot of new customers that, that you know, you have, have not worked with you in the past, but today really need your services. How do you sort of balance these two? And in general, how do you work with your customers, your shippers, your cargo partners in times like these? Um, and how important is it to maintain communication channels open with shippers and on ground handling and, uh, and carrier partners? Yeah, it's obviously critical. In our case, um, those customers that had regular allocations on our flights we protected all those regular customers. That's, that's gotta be our highest priority is the customers that are always with me every day in good times and bad, they get protected. Um, we always have a portion of our flight that we call free sell, and that is open to the market. We try to prioritize that right now on protective equipment or people that have urgent needs as opposed to uh, general, uh, general cargo. So, so we try to do a prioritization um, of that. And then, uh, with that, most of our communication, we used to do sales calls. Now it's, you know, Zoom is a great tool for us. We're using that so much now. Uh, phone calls, emails, we're using alternate methods to, to keep in contact with them, uh, understand their needs. And again, our customers have been very flexible in working with us. For instance, like I mentioned, you know, I can't break down their pallets because I just don't have enough staff. Their understanding of that, and they said, that's fine, just give it back to me, I'll do my own breakdown. So. Being flexible in the operation has also been very important with our customers and those that are willing to uh, work with those adjustments certainly would have a priority and 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 as we move forward. So, uh, Sean, how do the services pr provided by Air Cargo in general and a company like Nippon uh, Cargo contribute to making your shippers' supply chains more resilient? Yeah, obviously, a lot of freight, ninety percent by tonnage move by ocean, which in a 30, 45 day supply chain that works just fine. The resiliency and the point of air freight is we handle the slack, we handle the, the unmet demand and that's what we're seeing now. So our role, we understand our role is that we are that buffer inventory. When things go wrong, this is where you have to go. And there's always a portion, it's about 10% by, uh, by volume, it's about 60% by value, value that moves by air. So big difference there. Um, we, we know that we are that buffer supply chain. And in times like this, you can't wait 30 or 45 days for the ocean ship. So we have to do it. Um, so that's the role we play uh, in that. Um, like I said, we're adding capacity. We added three or four flights on the Trans-Pacific simply to meet this demand. And, and uh, you know, this, is, this is what we need to be doing. And that's a tougher question. And I guess you started by alluding to how long it takes to, uh, uh, you know, how long this crisis is going to last. But how long do you think the current situation can continue or could continue before your customers experience serious economic 
and fi financial hardship beyond what they may be already experiencing. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a good answer to that one. I wish I knew. Um, I think that the, the most recent couple of days, the news we hear, you know, we are starting to flatten the curve. We are starting to see that the number of cases not accelerate as fast. It's not as exponential. So, you know, we see these as positive signs, but it's only going to get better if people continue things like the, the social distancing, staying at home when they're possible. You know, with that, you know, hopefully in May, we start to see things pick up. I've heard, you know, talk of that from, uh, you know, different, different agencies. I don't know. Um, what we do know is we'll continue to operate as much as we can and helping out as many people as we can for as long as it's absolutely necessary. Um, we'll see what happens and, and we are pretty flexible in how we run the operation, which stations we fly to. With that flexibility, we hopefully can always tap in and, and, and hit the need that our customers have. So uh, this has been really enlightening. Uh, we're um, certainly pleased to hear that you're 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 running all your you know your 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 flights and able to uh, to meet this increased demand. Um, so uh, Sean, thank you very much. And do you have any final thoughts for us? You know, I think it's it's just it's a crazy time we're in right now, and uh, flexibility is the key, and and uh, keeping everybody safe. So we're going to continue to do that. We'll keep flying, and we'll keep people safe, and uh, I think we can meet the needs that way. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, honey. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So, Jared, you're the Chief Operating Officer of Alliance Ground International, which, along with sister companies Cargo Force and TSCS, are one of the largest privately owned cargo mail and freighter ground handling companies. You have many years of experience in, in, in this business and, and have a strong pulse on international cargo movements, and you've seen your shares of up and downs, international trade, and the airline industry in general. So how is the current disruption different from those previous experiences, and what are you seeing about economic activity and freight movements? Movement from your vantage point, and how much of a reduction in overall activity are you experiencing relative to the same time last year? Hi, good morning. Um, so yes, my um, our, our specific experience in in, in this situation is it, um, the effect of COVID nineteen is completely different than anything that we have seen before, right? So we um, in the past we've seen nine eleven. Nine eleven had a two week component to it. And, you know, we got back to work and, you know, slowly but surely we recovered. In, um, in this situation is unknown. The period is uh, indeterminate and, and we do not know the, the overwhelming impact that will happen after COVID-19, um, after the crisis. And so um, it's timeline. If I have to say what's the difference is the uncertainty of timeline, right? Mm -hmm. um, Regarding, regarding uh, our tonnages, so we, we're at 18 different locations um, and there are, when we say cargo handling, we, we get most of our cargo between passenger uh, flights and freighter flights. If we're talking about freighter flights, actually those flights have, um, that, that um, volume has increased um, over this period as of uh, passenger um, capacity pretty much went away with, with, the, with the flight cancellations. So, um, you know, in, those mar in the markets that we depend heavily on passenger flights, mm -hmm. we, are, we could experience about up to 85% decline, okay? Mm -hmm. In markets where we're uh, passenger, I mean, freighter, freighter aircraft dependent, then in those markets, we're actually ahead of the curve. We're, we're, we're experiencing a 20% uh, increase, right? So with this reduction in passenger air schedules then, are shippers and brokers able to find sufficient air capacity to meet their need? And what kind of service levels are they experiencing? Uh, so um, in other words, how soon are they able to see their cargo loaded and moved? So uh, that is that part is unknown to us. We we um, we're basically a handler that is hired by the airline, yep. the carrier, mm -hmm. and and so we don't we don't we're not privy to that piece of it. But um, I, I am I am assuming the capacity is very tight at the moment, and so um, it would be expensive and um, you know difficult to to move your cargo at the moment. 
Um, even so, even though I, I do preface that with the fact that airlines are adding more and more freighter flights, yep. um, or they're turning uh, passenger aircraft into cargo aircraft, um, and that is, I, I think, that is improving as we go along here. And so, what differences are you seeing between the international and the domestic air cargo markets in terms of the impact of the COVID nineteen pandemic? Okay, so on the international side, we've um, it basically falls under the same behavior pattern that I've described before, which is we are, you know, uh, for the most part, the U.S. is an importer, right? Mm -hmm. So the imports um, have stayed uh, basically strong on the freighter side uh, as it's, it's moved. So, for example, when Europe shut down, all of a sudden we saw a, a, a host of charter flights start to be scheduled um, to take over that capacity from the passenger side that went away. So you, you are finding that uh, there has been additional um, charter flights scheduled to sort of take up some of that slack so that the flow of goods has not been uh, severely disrupted. Correct, correct. So your company also handles a lot of mail for the U.S. Post Office. Does that also include packages? Uh, and is that segment pretty much stable or is it hard hit as well? So Cargo Force is a, um, a mail handler for the post office and it, it's a specific mail, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is the priority mail network that the post office uh, uh, coordinates through FedEx aircraft, right? Um, and so we're uh, a middle point, uh, an interface between the post office and Federal Express, and we containerize the freight or decontainerize it, um, or not the freight, but the mail, mm -hmm. um, as, uh, as, and we're that, that intermediary point, and we're the ones that uh, do the scanning. But it is priority mail. Um, that network has stayed very strong through this process. It is, again, freighter aircraft dependent. This all has to do with what type of aircraft it flies on. Mm -hmm. So um, on that end, we've actually experienced a 10% increase in, in mail volumes um, in this month. Interesting. So um, are there any particular procedures that you're following in handling cargo in order to limit the spread of the disease? Is this adding cost, um, handling and processing time at both origin and destination? It is. So we, we've, um, as, a, as a company uh, perspective, as a company, we, we decided to exceed or stay ahead of the CDC guidelines, not just go by CDC guidelines. So we, um, ahead of CDC announcing a uh, face cover for everyone, we actually had mandated uh, N95 masks for our um, employees. We uh, took the position that our cargo employees are frontline uh, folks that are, you know, uh, in, in the fight against the disease and and so we need to arm them with the best possible uh tools so aside from the cleaning cleaning of the facilities the uh the six feet um of separation and social distancing and, and all those great things that that we have pushed from the very beginning we were we actually had stayed stayed up ahead of everyone in as much as putting out guidelines and and having a form of communication and having a team um a team effort. We actually had a hotline for COVID um, about four weeks ago, um, and so we we have really tried to stay ahead for the safety of our employees and to protect this critical supply line that we we change we we um, that we service. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, wh where do you see the most critical vulnerabilities in our existing domestic? and international supply chains. Are you more concerned about the part that you handle, which is the terminals, the warehouses, the air forwarding facilities, possibly shutting down because of contamination concerns, labor getting sick, or you see more issues with finding carriers for the loads that shippers want to move and our, other capacity? Yeah, so our primary concern is staying healthy, keeping our facility operating. If our facility doesn't operate, um, then we affect the supply, supply chain for sure. Okay. So um, how do you work with your customers, shippers, cargo partners, the airlines in times like these? Um, how important is it to maintain communication channels open with the various entities involved in moving goods along the supply chain? 
it's ex extremely important to keep communication in these times. So we, um, we have stayed um, and communicated with each one of our carriers what our procedures were, uh, number one. Number two, uh, support. So we handle a lot of um, international carriers that are able to get us supplies for our employees. So that's been a great partnership. Um, one of, uh, I can tell you, uh, Atlas facilitated, for example, the, or facilitated the, the, the procurement of thermometers, um, infrared thermometers that you can't find. So we're, that's a new policy that we're pushing out um, and we're staying ahead of that by, um, by in every, every facility have a thermometer uh, measurement uh, mechanism. Uh, uh, how do the services that are provided uh, by your company contribute to making your shipper supply chains more resilient? And uh, what is the role of technology in this process, particularly information technology, for instance, and uh, electronic exchange of information and so on? So I think our role is, is critical in nature just because we're the, that intermediary that at the airport level that, that takes that cargo, breaks it down for the shippers, the various shippers that are shipping on that flight. Um, and so as far as technology, I would say, um, you know, if it wasn't for the technology we have today, it would be extremely difficult to do what we do. So, so much, for example, payments. Payments are done online now. Um, you know, the clearing of, of, of flights, international flights, it's done online. It's all electronic uh, with customs. Okay. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I don't think we could do what we do today without the technologies that we have pushed out um, over time. And so uh, this is a tough question. How long do you think the current situation can continue before your airline customers and the shippers that rely on their services experience serious economic and financial hardship? And one could argue that they're already experiencing serious economic and financial hardship. But how, how long do you see the situation continuing before things are just not moving anymore? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, I think, um, I think things will always move. Um, again, the freighter market has stayed very healthy. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm more concerned about is the lasting effect. So post COVID-19, mm -hmm. say we find a cure tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? Um, it will take a long time to get back to normal, right? Mm -hmm. And so how will that happen? Uh, if, if we go into recession, um, the, our, our demand for all these products will come down. And so, um, you know, our volumes will, will, will obviously, um, you know, decrease. And so I, I, think, I think the supply will always be protected. Um, what I'm more concerned about is our demand. Our demand is definitely going to be impacted by a recession that is sustained over a period of time. Well, Jared, thank you very much for your time today. Do, do you have any final thoughts for us and for our audience today before we, we, uh, before we part, before we let you go back to your uh, extremely busy day? Um, this has definitely been an interesting uh, experience. It's almost like a Hollywood movie. Um, and it just, uh, it's like a zombie ap ap apocalypse. Um, so we, we just, um, we're trying to, I've seen the whole world be reactionary, right? So we're all being reactionary. There is no one being proactive at the moment um, and just trying to save um, everybody's business and, and, and you know, uh, try to, try to weather the storm, right? But it's unprecedented is the only word I can find here. Well, I know we'll, we'll, we'll always need the services that, that, that you and your company are providing and we wish you and, and, and your company and your employees all the best. Thank you very much, Jared. Thank you, honey. Thank you. So, um, Helen, um, you're managing director of United Cargo Sales. You're responsible for planning and directing United Cargo's team of professionals who manage uh, some of the organization's largest global accounts. You've been with United since uh, 1995, I believe, and you've held significant management positions across the airline, both the passenger and the cargo side. And you, Mark, you've, uh, you're director of cargo logistics for, for United. You're overseeing the 
costs and capital expenditures, uh, as well as managing all the actual sort of assets uh, that, you know, that, that, that move, uh, that, that cargo. And you've been with United since the mid 80s, uh, had a number of management positions, scheduling, planning, and so on. And so, uh, you know, both of you have quite a bit of experience uh, in the airline industry and in transportation logistics. Um, you've seen your share of ups and downs um, and uh, in terms of crises, you know, from 9-11 on, uh, onwards to other uh, epidemics and so on. So uh, how is the current situation, the current disruption different from these previous ones? And um, looking at it from the, the cargo side, what are you seeing about economic activity and freight movement from your vantage point, particularly how much of a reduction, I guess, uh, in overall activity on the cargo side are you experiencing relative to the same time last year. And of course, with the airline side, it's, it's not so much a demand issue on the cargo, it's really more a supply issue because of the demand issue on the passenger side. So it gets more complicated. So if you could help us with that. Very good. Sure, sure. go ahead, Helen. I was gonna say, Mark, why don't you start with the, with like from the previous experience and how it compares, and then I can talk a little bit um, about the uh, the demand side of things. Great. Sure. I, I think the difference is, you know, one of the differences with with this, we saw it coming a little bit. Uh, when I look at 9-11, it just kind of happened very quickly. But then about two weeks later, uh, things, you know, started uh, ultimately getting back to normal, or at least there was a move to get back to normal. You know, the difference now is there's just a, a complete uncertainty of when this will all end, how long will it take to ramp up, when will we ultimately be, uh, get to the point where we were before all of this happened. The other thing is, you know, in, in previous instances, not just 9-11 when we've had issues, if there was an issue in Asia, we could focus on uh, Latin or uh, Europe and, and vice versa. And you know where this is different is it's really applying to the entire world. So I think, you know, that, that's from a, uh, a how it is different perspective. Um, the other item that I would want to add is what we're focusing on is really about medical supplies and metal medical related items, and that's mostly from import. A lot of that's coming from Asia, so PPE, medical devices, and things like that. And then from, a, from an export perspective, it's, it's general commodities, although we know that's slowed down quite a bit because there's far less manufacturing going on as well. But, you know, we're talking about a 97% reduction in, in passenger aircraft. Wow. But we'll get to it later on some things we're doing on the cargo side with that. But, but that's just completely different than anything we've ever seen. Wow. Helen, you yeah, I, I would just say that it really is unprecedented. Our our company talks about um, scenarios that they do, war games, if you will, mm -hmm. and what's the worst case scenario. And 9-11 used to be the, the scenario that you ran. How would the company respond to that? And this has given us a, a new and far worse worst case scenario. And And that the the uncertainty is the piece that is just so difficult there's no predicting when the quote unquote light at the end of the tunnel would be so we feel fortunate in that we do understand that commerce still has to move and that we can play a part in that in in moving desperately needed supplies throughout the world and so it's the first time that cargo has ever had this type of a role in in um, in a worst case scenario. So I think that that's the biggest difference from anything that we'd ever planned for as a company. So um, I guess uh, pre COVID nineteen, United had about five thousand flights a day, roughly uh, that you know to all parts of the world, um, about seven hundred and seventy aircraft. And uh, as uh, Mark had mentioned, a lot of that now is is, is gone uh, because of the forced lockdown, kind of uh, on, on on all of us. Um, so. Um, and, and typically, as I understand it, about 50% of all air cargo moves in 
sort of the bellies of passenger planes and about 50% goes in all cargo aircraft. Uh, so um, while there's been a substantial reduction of flight schedules, United at one point indicated that it will continue flying six daily international operations covering Asia, Australia, Latin America, the Middle East, and Europe in an effort to get customers where they need to be and their cargo where it needs to be. That was back in March 25, it's like an eternity uh, ago. Um, are you able practically, you know, again, you have many customers who want to move things. You mentioned medical, and I'm sure there's other uh, time sensitive uh, uh, products as well. Are you able to find sufficient capacity to meet the demands of your customers? And what kind of service levels are you able to provide? In other words, uh, how soon are you able to take a load uh, or to, to, to load the cargo that's sent it to you? Yeah, I would, I mean, I think it, it's really amazing. It's really been a real uh, quick to market, nimble, very, very aggressive response that we've had because because we've never really done this before in my lifetime, but, but almost immediately we're running between 20 and 30 cargo only flights right now, which are really passenger aircraft where you're putting freight in the bellies. Mm -hmm. It's all wide body mm -hmm. aircraft right, right now, no passengers. So because there's no passengers, you're able to put more cargo on these flights. So in general, it, it equates to about one and a half uh, passenger flights that you're, you're able to operate. One of our, our biggest capacity we've gone is 40 tons mm -hmm. in one of these bellies. And, and we're averaging about 20 because we have a mix of, of density, you know, as you're running a lot of these pounds and masks yeah. and, and things like that. But uh, really from a United Airlines perspective, Almost Im Im immediately, there was a team put together with uh, the pilot group, the flight attendant group, the aircraft scheduling group, the finance group, and they, they put a team together that, that almost runs 24-7 right now where we're able to just tell them what flights we need, mm -hmm. and they've been able to find us the aircraft, and, and we're even telling what air, what aircraft we need. Mm -hmm. um, from, a, from a backlogs perspective, um, clearly in China, we're seeing some backlogs. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there, there is some markets that we have not been able to serve like we've wanted to, like Latin and, and South America. But uh, again, as most of our flights are in Asia and, uh, and also to uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, what's really encouraging from a passenger standpoint is we are adding three more passenger flights back into the schedule in May. Uh, we've got Washington, Frankfurt, Chicago, London, and three-day-a-week service, Houston to Buenos Aires. So we're thrilled to be able to see that. We'd love to see that people are moving as well. Mm -hmm. From a cargo standpoint, we know there's not going to be as many bags as in the past because even on the flights, there will be social distancing. Mm -hmm. So plenty of more opportunity for the cargo side of things. Mm -hmm. But the fleet that we've been using is comprised mainly of 777-300s, 787-9s, yep. seven, seven, and 787-10s. Seven, seven, mm -hmm. um, the, the first two of those, excellent aircraft anywhere you fly them, uh, but especially good in the, in the Asia Pacific USA arena. Uh, they can carry a great payload, uh, very, very dependable. The 787-10 seven, seven, is a little shorter range aircraft, and that one is ideal for, for the European routings that we're doing. Um, should Latin America develop, and we expect it probably will, um, that would be another strong aircraft for that routing. As we found that we were utilizing every aircraft we can get our hands onto, we've mm -hmm. actually started to tap into the 777-200 fleet as well. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not as fuel efficient, so they were the last ones that we wanted to tap into from, a, from the standpoint of um, op operating them efficiently. But the demand is there and we can certainly fill them. So we continue to open up new markets in, in Europe, we've got uh, London, Frankfurt, uh, Tel Aviv that are passenger flights. Uh, we do have cargo flights on there as well. And we also have uh, Brussels, uh, Dublin has been added. We've been having flights there. In China uh, and in Asia Pacific, we've got Hong Kong, Shanghai, Chengdu. We've been operating some Taipei and Beijing is opening up this week to us. We've got the authorities for that now. So it's quite a robust schedule. In what we would call the Americas, we even have San Juan and Guam. We've been running operations and it's both freight and mail. It's not just the, the, the cargo demand, the mm -hmm. mail demand is there as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, from a service standpoint, we offer all of the services we did really in the past. Um, the only thing for, for domestic, there were a couple of things like human remains that we scaled back a little bit on mm -hmm. because we might not have the right aircraft um, to be able to fulfill the need for a human remains shipment. But mm -hmm. for the most part, we're 100% on the service. And so these flights that you mentioned uh, are also for passengers or only for freight? They're only for freight. That's part of that tapping into the transformation that you and I talked about just a few minutes before. Mm -hmm. wow. That is our passenger flights with cargo in the belly. And I think Mark is doing some amazing work to see what we can do to utilize the planes even furthermore. So among your customers, your, your, your you know, sort of large accounts that, you tip, that, that typically re rely on you, uh, you know, for air cargo, what sectors are you seeing as the most hard hit? in this crisis? And where have there been new opportunities with increased time sensitive demands? And you mentioned medical, of course. Uh, could you comment on that aspect? Yeah, I would say sectors hard hit, uh, first off would be the perishable market. And I, I think that makes sense, right? Is, is you watch the news and you see what people are stocking up on. It's not on perishable items. It's, it's, it's more on, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, we listened to the toilet paper and, mm -hmm. and things that will last longer, obviously, mm -hmm. right? So the perishable market has been speci uh, specifically hard hit. Um, China to US is a key market, as we mentioned, from a medical perspective. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and in Europe and Asia are the big markets that we've been able to, to hit, as, as Helen mentioned. And then uh, uh, I also mentioned earlier, haven't been able to meet the needs for Latin and South America at this point. It's something that we will be looking at, mm -hmm. but those are uh, specific items of where we're focusing and where we're not focusing at the moment. Mm -hmm. given, given the timing of when this all started too, you know, keep in mind, this was right around Chinese New Year where, where so much of the manufacturing, manufacturing was closed in Asia Pacific and in China especially. And so the, uh, I think automotive and heavy manufacturing were two of the areas that were hardest hit early on because some of the things that would have been coming out of China to support those types of manufacturing, especially in Europe, but also here in the US, those flows just didn't start up and of course have been replaced by the, 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 medical, uh, the medical needs. But what about like exports to Asia, let's say of uh, fresh fruit and vegetables and things of that nature, which I understand are typically fly out of the West Coast? We have been flying perishables. Um, we, we have been putting some of the perishables on, but it's still a little bit early in the growing season. Uh, but the, the discussions are underway of what the needs will be as we hit the end of, well, actually the beginning of May is really when they're saying uh, we're going to be seeing the perishables start to, to surge a little bit there. And we just need to really look at where the market's developing. The good news is we have a lot of flights out of China into the U.S. Um, so we should be able to get the perishables back in the other direction. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I would, I would add to that, it, it remains to be seen. So cherry season is coming up and it, it's very, very big for United Airlines. And uh, be, with the limited capacity, is it, are we going to be able to, will there be the market for these perishables? Will, will there be a market for cherries? Mm -hmm. And we just don't know right now because the focus is on the medical equipment and, uh, and uh, products that are not perishable. Yeah. So Mark, this is probably a question for you, but in terms of sort of the health side, uh, are there any particular procedures that you're following in handling cargo in order to limit the spread of the disease? Uh, and is this adding cost, handling and processing time, both origin and destination? Yeah, that's a very important topic for United Airlines and, and uh, Helen could, could probably comment on it too as well, but every meeting we're on, it, it always starts on how are the people doing and how are your families doing, how are the employees doing and safety of the employees. It's, it's been, it's a number one focus for United Airlines and always has been, but clearly uh, PPE are being used, uh, mask, gloves, uh, disinfecting, sanitizing. We're obviously using the social distancing and, and so forth as well. So following all of those things very, very strictly and, and very, very good communication with our service providers to make sure that, that we are in sync and that 
of, of following those things as well. Additionally, I'd like to add, we do have business uh, continuity plans in mm -hmm. all of our locations. So how, how we'd be able to handle those particular scenarios. Um, and then, you know, how we would be able to handle a temporary shutdown, uh, have uh, contracts with cleaning companies that would come in and clean and when we would open back up, formal notification and, and those types of things, even, even down to a, a person level on, on how that's notified. So uh, very important to us, a lot of effort put into it. From a cost perspective, honestly, I would say it's, it's fairly minimal cost in, in providing those types of items. So fairly easy to do. Um, how it's handled in our processing time, um, you know, it's, as you would expect, it's adding a, a little bit of time and it takes a little more effort, but nothing that is, is really changing the paradigm that much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Helen, is this something you want to no, that's, I think, you know, Mark, uh, really and truly, his, his team is the one that really puts in the support that we need to make sure the front line has the, the protection and that we're trying to keep them as safe as possible every day that they go to work. Uh, I know we've been coordinating some shipments out of Asia that will also provide PPE for the United employees. We want to make sure that everyone is covered and safe. Okay, so stepping back a little bit and kind of going back to, to supply chains at this point, wh where do you see the most critical vulnerabilities in our existing domestic and international supply chains? We concerned more about nodes, terminals, warehouses, air forwarding facilities shutting down, say because of contamination concerns or labor getting sick or more issues with finding carriers for the loads that shippers um, you know want to move finding capacity or is it sort of both of uh, both of those yeah i would just say i think the important vulnerabilities that i see right now are things that we don't know that are going to come up or that pop up very very quickly i'll, I'll give you an example so in in china when we were running these cargo only flights into china and then the rules just changed overnight and the crews will be tested and possibly quarantined and held. You know, that's, again, as I mentioned, how important that is to United Airlines, that is, is unacceptable to put our employees in those types of situations. So we had to work on alternate plans with that. You know, can you stop in a, another city or, or country nearby and then do, uh, do an in and out into those particular locations? So I, I think that's the, the biggest piece right now. I, I will add as well, on the contingency side, I mentioned it earlier, is contingency plan for location shutdown. So in New York, obviously there was some thoughts that that maybe there would be enough cases that there, there wouldn't be uh, a, enough people to manage the airspace and the airports and things like that. So we looked at, could we now uh, move to a different hub? Would we move to Washington, Dallas, or would we move to Chicago? So we had those plans already, if that were to happen, mm -hmm. that we'd immediately be able to to do a quick move. And then also for specific short-term contaminations to be able to shut down and ramp back up quickly. Hmm. Very interesting. So um, and the, you know, with this crisis going on, how do you work with your customers, with your shippers, your cargo partners uh, in times like these? And how important is it to maintain communication channels open with your shippers and your uh, on-ground carrier partners? This is Helen's expertise. I'm going to let her go first and then I'll, <laughs> I'll fill in afterwards. Yeah. You know, from, from the customer and the shipper side, uh, communication is vital. That, that Everybody has shifted over very, very quickly uh, using different technologies. We've got Zoom, Microsoft Teams, uh, WebExes. There's so many different ways for us to communicate. We're using IMs, texts, mm -hmm. uh, and, and lots and lots of conference calls. Internally, uh, Jan's team, we started off with two calls a day with the leadership team so that we could respond nimbly and quickly seven days a week. We reached out to our customers right away, and we also found that from the passenger side, 
we have a number of customers that are very important on the passenger side that are also our top um, shippers on the cargo side and they have the relationship with the forwarders so there were so many discussions that were opened up and the whole thing that was key to the success of getting this operation started and having it be successful from day one is that there was a need to be very open and very transparent uh, when there were challenges if we had to respond to it it was better to have a larger group of people thinking about what the possible uh, solutions could be and what the ramifications could be. And that way we were able to move very, very quickly and be nimble. The example that, that Mark just gave about the, what we call a tech stop mm -hmm. on the way to China, yeah. I, I was shocked at how quickly we were able to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And we had to communicate with our shippers right away because we had shipments that were, or our forwarders, I mean, we had shipments that were booked already um, the following day after we were open for service to China and we had to shut it again. But everyone worked together and we solved it quickly and we've been able to, to, to make up the time, put more flights in and, and really get things moving again. So open, honest, transparent communication and over communicate if anything. Thank you. So, um, Mark, I, I wasn't sure, Mark, I think you might have a little bit with our, with our partners that help get our plan yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna add, I mean, this is what, what we do very well and it's driven by our president, Jan Krams, is mm -hmm. the, the communication piece is, is uh, what, what we're very good at and, and what we do every single day. So it was, it was easy for us to pivot and just bring it into this area. It's critical for our customers to know the impacts uh, and like the tech stop, like the different things that we're doing. Uh, an example is on our cargo warehouses from a cost perspective, service providers had to reduce hours. So we were able to do that very quickly, notify our customers quickly because we're in constant contact with them. Gauge changes hand, uh, sometimes are within hours of departure to be able to communicate that with our customers as well. But in, in short, the internal and external communication has just been absolutely incredible. And that's why we've been able to move so quickly to be able to fill, fill some voids here. So would you say then that the services that United Cargo provides contribute to making your shippers supply chains more resilient because you've been able to be more dynamic and nimble and so on? You know, I, I, I can't even say it enough, the creative options, you know, a company as large as us, how quickly we've mm -hmm. been able to react, how quickly. And it, it, it is amazing in this time to the uh, uh, aircraft planning group and, the, and these different groups just can't do enough to help. Uh, the, the all hours of the day that we're having conference calls to be able to pull everybody together. I like the word nimble. Mm -hmm. and creative, uh, there are those two words that we've been able to do. It, it's just amazing to me and, and it's very refreshing to see that we've been able to do that. Um, quite frankly, we're just moving the, uh, we're moving the capacity where the demand is and, and it's, uh, it's worked out really well. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think if, if you think about traditional cargo, some people might say that the um, cargo and the services with it have become somewhat commoditized over the years. But the thing that hasn't become commoditized at all is really the people. Um, you know, we've got a great group of people at United and we've got great partners, uh, whether it's on the handling side, the forwarding side or the shipping side, but we've got people who are eager, um, they're forward thinking, um, they collaborate and they push the boundaries to find ways to say yes. And that was what would, I, I would say that was what enabled us to launch our very first flight uh, as a cargo only flight or freight only flight. That was March 19th that we allowed, uh, that we, had, we, we were able to get that flight off the ground. It was really, really fast and it couldn't have been done without the people. So I recall that pre-COVID-19, Jan Krams um, had mentioned to us that cargo contributed a larger share of United's profits than passenger travel in relation to their respective magnitudes. Uh, do you see cargo as an essential ingredient, I guess, to the financial viability and performance of the airline, certainly during these times, but also once the situation starts to normalize again? And will cargo get more respect? <laughs> yeah, I, 
I, I was just going to make the point. Hey, you know, I want to be fair about this. You know, we're we're 1.2 billion dollars in in revenue, which is which is a big number, but I think it's less than two and a half percent of United Airlines revenue. So I I want to put things into perspective. But on the other side, it it is really interesting how this thing has turned around, and we basically become a cargo airline right now. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about the passenger side down 97% and where everything we're doing is bringing positive contribution to the airline and it's lightening, lightening the burden and it's, and it's not only bringing revenue in, but bringing positive contribution. And I think it's very refreshing. And again, it's very refreshing that we've been able to do this so quickly and get everybody on board to do that. Yeah, I, I would only add that yesterday during Jan's division meeting, Oscar Munoz joined our meeting. And you know, for Oscar to do that, it was so kind of him, but he wanted to reach out to the people that may have made this happen and express his gratitude for that. Um, we've got the full support of, of Oscar and of Scott Kirby as well to push as much freight as possible because I think all of us recognize the fact that we don't know how quickly and what form the passenger flights will take as they return. Uh, because of social distancing, it may change what a seating chart looks like on a passenger aircraft. And if there are not as many passengers up top, there's always more opportunity for freight in the belly. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, it, it's not that cargo has become the all important part of the airline now, but we can certainly help to support the airline through this time until we get back to something closer to what it was before COVID-19. So you mentioned the uncertainty in the time frames and so on. How long do you think the current situation could continue before your customers, and we're talking now about the cargo customers, experience serious economic and financial hardship? Not that they aren't already, but um, when will this rubber band snap, I guess, is the way I like to describe it. Yeah, I think from from our perspective and our and our president uh, Jan Krems has communicated this up through United Airlines is we expect the the cargo to come back very quickly. We expect it as soon as we start ramping up flights that there's going to be significant demand uh, both from a mail and freight perspective, and we expect to have some uh, major increases all along the way and 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 full flights. So. When that's going to happen, a, you know, I'll leave that. I'll leave that up to the experts. But we are very sure that when that does happen, that we will be ready, and the cargo demand will be there. And and clearly, uh, we believe it'll snap back a lot quicker than the passenger demand. I, I would like to hope that that both would equally, but uh, we we definitely think that they, there's pent up cargo demand, and and that will uh, increase significantly uh, along with the flight schedule. Yeah. I, from a customer standpoint, when you think about, uh, you know, the, their economic and financial hardships, I mean, everybody is looking at how cash flow, that, that's something that people absolutely have to look at. But things have changed so drastically, it is impossible to really say um, who's going to experience hardship and, and to what degree. You know, we see this supply chain developing for the medical needs, but there's also the day-to-day -day needs of, of people. And at, I, I use the grocery stores or, you know, the, the essential, uh, essential businesses as, a, as an example. They look to be doing fine in this time period because there is demand for their product there. But if you look at the way that they're having to operate, their whole model has changed completely. They've got higher costs and lower productivity. They've got people standing in a line outside because they can only have so many people in the store at once. So there you're speaking to the productivity side. Overnight, they've hired extra people to stock shelves. They pay them more to do it and they've got people putting together grocery orders that they then deliver um, through online ordering. So you, know, you look at that model and it's hard to say what the economic and financial hardships will be because even their their normal model has changed despite the fact that they're open for business mm -hmm. um, you know office supplies is another area that I was thinking about you know in this in, in in the current environment there was a lot of push for office supplies companies how do you help support people that are now working from home um, 
So it, on, on the surface, it looks like they must be doing fantastic because the orders are through the roof mm -hmm. for all these technologies to support work from home. But keep in mind that most of these big retailers and, and the supply chains behind them used to have a very large business base for office buildings and such. And it, it's not that different than what happened with toilet paper. The mm -hmm. run on toilet paper was because the the consumer, the, you know, that the household consumption increased by 40% because people weren't using the bathrooms at their workplace. And that's what caused the, that shortage in the first place. Um, and it, it had, they had to change their supply chain from the big roles that you use in an industrial environment to what people use in their houses. So I, it, it's really, really hard to say what the overall impact is going to be because even for those that seem to thrive, the model has changed. Absolutely. Well, this has been extremely informative. Uh, I'm really always been pleased to hear that these new services are being introduced to keep uh, at least the cargo moving. Uh, hopefully, us passengers will start moving again. Uh, can't wait for that next flight uh, um, whenever. Um, anyway, <laughs> so uh, do you have any final thoughts for us uh, that you'd like our audience to take away from this conversation? Yeah, quickly for me, um, you see a 97% reduction in flights. Uh, we're no longer in the Willis Tower. We're working from home. You would think it'd be a more relaxed work environment. And I think Helen can attest to the number of calls that we're on. It, it's the exact opposite. We're working harder than, than we ever have in our lives. Um, what's amazing to me, and I, I guess it shouldn't be because we have 100,000 employees, but how many uh, uh, people that, that are known in this industry, government officials, organizations uh, from humanitarian companies and so forth. I mean, personal friends of people that have come to us. We actually had to set up a group and a standard operating procedure to be able to bring these in, to be able to handle them. But when we look at all those types of things we're doing from a humanitarian basis, and remember, not just cargo, we're also doing repatriation flights right. for passengers to get them, to get them back in. So the, the last one I'd like to leave you with, which makes it all worth it for me, we, we got a, uh, I got a call from, from one of our executive team. At, it was about 6 p.m. one evening a week or so ago. And it was a part for a machine to go to the Mayo Clinic that was testing for, for COVID. And they said, hey, it was, in, it was in Newark and there's no way to get it. We need to get it uh, to another location. So uh, we were able to, in a, in a matter of an hour, 60 to 90 minutes, get it on a flight, make some calls to make sure that that flight was not one of them that was uh, canceled or combined with another flight. When it was in route, called the station manager of the station on the other end, they drove to the airport, made sure that the part was picked up and delivered over. I mean, that's what, to me, what makes it all, all worth it. But there's just so much humanitarian work going on. And, and that's, the really nice thing to be able to see and the thing that, that makes it easy to be able to do all of this extra work. So you should be sure. Yeah, you. And, and I, I would just say from, from my standpoint, like th these are really, really tough times. Things are, people are going through horrible experiences right now. The, the human side of this is so impactful. Um, but, you know, I'm very hopeful we as, <laughs> as a human race, we're going to get through it and we're going to be stronger for it. Every one of us that is, is working so hard right now, hopefully that makes us better prepared for anything that will be thrown at us in the future because it is an uncertain world. But um, we continue to find uh, ways and dig deep and get resources that, that enable us to deal with it and deal with it effectively. Well, speaking of free patriation flights, please send one to bring Jan back. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you both so much. Um, I, I, again, I know how busy you are with with all this, uh, all the demand uh, on the limited capacity that you're you're providing, and on your you know the demands on your personal time. So, uh, thank you both, and uh, again, hope to be on a on a on a flight sometime. <laughs> not to this yeah, this, future. this is our this is our pleasure, and as Jan always says, we we have cargo in our blood, and and. So this, this is truly really our pleasure to be able to 
to be able to communicate and uh, to everybody through via this. Thank you, and well, wishing you, you, you all well the best. Thank you very we much. We look forward to welcoming you aboard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this brings us to uh, the end of the recorded uh, portion of our interviews. Uh, and now we go into uh, the live Q&A session. Uh, I'm delighted that we have with us today uh, um, uh, Sean McWhorter from um, um, All Nippon Cargo. Uh, we also have Jared Esqui from uh, Alliance Ground International, uh, as well as Helen uh, Christensen from uh, uh, from United. Uh, I don't know if Mark is able to join us today or not, but uh, I'm really pleased that we could have representatives from, uh, again, all three of our, uh, of our companies today. Uh, we also have uh, Brett Johnson with us, who is our Senior Associate Director at the Transportation Center. And um, Brett, oh, here we have Mark. Um, hello, uh, Mark Albrecht from, uh, from United. So uh, Brett Johnson will be, uh, is monitoring the um, um, the Q&A line. Uh, so, if you, uh, several of you have been asking questions uh, as we as we go through, uh, and uh, uh, Brett has been monitoring those. You can continue to ask questions through the Q&A feature uh, of Zoom, uh, and uh, Brett will be uh, reading uh, these questions when um, we know who who it's from. He will also indicate that, and uh, will direct the question to the. Uh, individuals uh, who are who you know if the question is directed to them directly or we may then take answers from uh, from all of our uh, panelists here today so uh brett you want to uh, take it from here uh sure thank you honey um i may have to go in one at a time and make sure i'm unmuting people uh to answer questions i've unmuted a few so far but uh, the first question I want to start off with is from uh, uh, Annalise Riles, who's the director of our Buffett Institute at Northwestern. And she asked Sean, um, do you know of any effort to get governments to coordinate around quarantine and border rules to reduce friction in the system? Uh, yeah, the short answer there is uh, no. We have trouble getting our own government to cooperate between states and federal and, and within federal units. Um, once we cross borders and go international, it seems that every country has a different set of rules. Uh, there's different restrictions on, on what we're allowed to do, who's allowed to come in, whether they get quarantined. So that's probably been one of the biggest challenges of operating the network is making sure that we're compliant with all the local rules that each country puts in. This is a good question for United to take as well. Um, I agree. I was going to Mark want to take that. I was going to say, is Mark okay? Um, yeah, you know, I I I wholeheartedly agree with Sean. This is it's it, it's really really tough right now. We're getting requests um, as states gather together and they're they're grouping themselves to try to put orders in and get supplies. And of course we see FEMA has a pretty big, what they call an air bridge going as well, but everyone is competing for the same space and it does not feel like there's a coordinated effort for it. Yeah, I, I would agree. I don't have much to add in this arena. I, I just, you know, we're just trying to do what we can in, in, in the United States and to be able to make it work here. And it, it, it does make it more difficult with the international exposure. Yeah, I, th I think the challenge is each country and each government agency is doing their best to protect people. That's their goal, is they want to protect people. But what they don't fully understand and what they haven't considered is those of us trying to operate aircraft in order to bring supplies in, you have to write in an exception. You have to write in a procedure. You have to put a process that we're allowed to still operate. As, as, as I know, uh, I think Mark mentioned earlier, we can't have flight crews getting stranded in different countries. It's just unacceptable. So when they put in rules about quarantine for anybody that comes in, all of a sudden our answer is, well, then I can't operate there. And then it's like, oh, we didn't think about the airline. So then they're putting exceptions in for flight crews. And we see this not just with foreign countries. We've seen this in some of the U.S. stations as well. So it's just, it's a difficult process. The intention is very good. It's to protect people. It's not always understanding the operational difficulties that we deal with. Jared, is this something you want to um, add to? I don't know if 
Okay, I don't know if Jerry is hearing me here. Okay. Um, yeah, here he is. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm not at, at the same level. I'm sort of in the bottom of the food chain here in this in this uh, panel. But <laughs> um, so I've um, I tell you what, I, we we um, I was I was talking to a South American carrier the other day, and I said, why aren't you guys and you operate freighters? Why aren't you guys operating at the same pace as everybody? You know, the Asian carriers and, and everybody else. And so um, you know, they explain the concept of regional presence, <laughs> right? And it's, it's, you know, coming from the U.S., it's hard to understand that, too. But, you know, it's kind of like George, Florida uh, doesn't let you go into Georgia all of a sudden. And your crews are coming in from Florida, and then you, you're flying out of uh, Georgia. So um, when he explained that, I thought, wow. So, you no. Know, and then again, you know, decreased demand for, you know, for uh, fruits, uh, you know, all that bit has been affecting them. But um, yeah, the regional presence uh, has been, has something uh, I, I never really put a lot of thought to. Yeah. Well, very good question, Annelise. Thank you very much. Brett, you want to go to the next one? Yeah, here's the question I'm going to ask both United and uh, Sean again. Um, uh, this comes from Doug Rose, and it asks, uh, are you seeing demand for humanitarian cargo services, and how do you balance those uh, versus regular cargo? Uh, you know, which, you know, might be making you more regular uh, revenue. Um, I think Sean may have addressed this in his comments, but I thought it was important to uh, bring it up again. Yeah, uh, first, hi, Doug. Good to hear from you, uh, former colleague of mine. Um, it's, it, it's a difficult situation when there's so much demand and we want to help out everybody that we can. Um, our basic uh, uh, policy is we support the customers that have allocations on the flights and we know that they're moving the humanitarian supplies and then the unallocated space we try to prioritize based on the needs of the goods that are out there so the, the medical and, and relief supplies will get priority uh, after the allocated customers yeah from from our perspective we've been able to do both uh, surprisingly and uh, and I think some of it's been by luck that we We've had extra space and been able to, to take both. But uh, one of the other things we're working on, I, I, if you're not aware, you know, we've been working, I, we have a meeting every single day with the FAA and we're looking at putting putting products uh, uh, in in the cab. And so we, we actually did a test flight on Monday where we were able to fill up all the overhead bins and, and closets and then work continues to try to, to put items in seats. I think you saw Air Canada and also Lufthansa pull some seats out and so forth being, being creative. But uh, from our perspective, that the overhead bins and closets work really well for that, those kind of items for PPE and, and masks and those types of things. So, but it's a good question. And we, we've been able to do both and hopefully we don't have to choose. But, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're very much into the humanitarian component. Mark, Mark had referenced um, during the, the, the initial recording that we've actually set up a central area for people to come to and uh, put their requests through there. We also do have a, a few aircraft that are more or less set aside right now to start to address those, uh, th those requests as well. Uh, truth be told, a, a lot of stuff that's coming in, people just want to get the equipment and they're working with forwarders very, very quickly to get those in. So we, we carried a lot of PPE. Uh, Jerry, do you want to address this one at all? No, I mean, we, we've seen, we've been witness to the PPE coming in. Um, specifically in Chicago, we actually had an interview. Uh, our, our, uh, our folks were interviewed um, at one of our facilities uh, from the local news and just showing how the masks were coming in and, and bulk loads. Of course, you can't find one in the store, but. Um, they're still coming in heavy, um, and I think that'll continue to, you know, to improve the supply chain. Locally here, you know, and I'll comment, um, my friend is a CFO of our local hospitals uh, in South Florida, and, and they, um, I had to put them in touch with someone to, to try to get, you know, the mask. So they were having a problem. He says, I didn't have a problem with finding them in my supplier that I normally order from. I had a problem with the supply chain. I had a problem getting, getting them here, so. 
Okay, I've got a couple of uh, new questions and I'm gonna call bad news, good news. And I'm gonna start uh, with a question from Hadi who asks, uh, what are the top three products facing a shortage in freighter capacity over the uh, medium term? I know we've heard about certain supply chains that are more or less shut down. So this is a slightly different question, I think. So which products, see the notes, which products are not- Are you seeing a shortage in capacity? Like, is there- Yeah, yeah so, so just the PPE in general, the demand is just bigger than, than the amount of capacity that we all have. And, and, and it's a great thing that United is out there. They're putting these flights up and I can only imagine most of the product they're moving is PPE. It's because it doesn't, it doesn't fit on the freighters. There's, there's so much freighter capacity and it's already full that we need more capacity. So whether it, it's masks or it's ventilators or it's, it's, it's gowns or whatever the product is, it's all grouped together and, and we're carrying all of it. I don't know that I could distinguish one from another, but as a group by far, um, that is the that is the product that's coming into the country, and there's there's more in the warehouses in Asia than we have capacity to carry right now. So it's a great thing that uh, United and some of the others have have uh, been able to to add to that capacity. Uh, Mark or Helen, do you want to address that one? I, Mark, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing that I would say is if you look at where the majority of the flights are flying and, and the freighters that are operating and whether it's passenger or true freighters, I would say that what you might start to see is some seasonal type vegetables that you would normally see in the grocery store. They may not be finding the capacity to get to the, those grocery stores. So I would see that, say that on the perishable side, I, it might be some things that you would say, oh, you know, it's salmon season, so you know I'm going to get more salmon, and it's a better price. Those things might be a little harder to get into um, the areas where the demand is. I I didn't have anything to add. I think um, Sean and Helen were spot on. So related to that question is, and maybe the answer is PPE equipment. Uh, but uh, have you have you seen any new opportunities for air freight uh, air freight during this crisis? Um, what origin destinations, uh, what type of goods that comes from Husseini? Sure, and, and I guess um, air freight tends to move based on where the capacity is. So there's a lot of intra-Asia movements to get the air freight to places like Shanghai where we all fly the capacity. What we're starting to see though is more demand for air freight directly from the origin. So Vietnam, Malaysia, places that typically export through China or export through a secondary city, they're now asking, can you fly here directly? We need it more urgently. We wanna reduce the transit time. So, so it is starting to uh, show where the emerging markets are a little clearer. So that's an interesting, is that, is that a change in sort of in sourcing? Uh, do you think altogether or is just a change in routing? It, it's a change that we saw going on a year, 18 months ago where supply is moving out of China into mm -hmm. other parts of Asia. Mm -hmm. But because the infrastructure of places like Vietnam is not sufficient to handle the capacity for the freighters and, and all the passenger flights that they would need, it still exports through a traditional gateway where the infrastructure is there, be it a Hong Kong or be it a, a Shanghai. Now what we're starting to hear requests for is, we want you to come directly here. We'll find a way to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. um, just because it's a more efficient routing, it'll get it here quicker. Mm -hmm. And those are, that's demand that we, that, that they were satisfied with the, with the routing through Hong Kong in the past. Now they're saying, maybe uh, you need to come here sooner. Mm -hmm. and, and we're continuing to look at those opportunities. Yeah. Is that because it's harder for them to get it to Hong Kong or? Uh... And it would be quicker to move it directly out of a place like Vietnam now. Yeah, so from, a, yeah. from a United Airlines perspective, I mean, we're, we're new to this. I mean, Sean does this for a living and we're just trying to keep up. Even from when we did the previous interview where we said we were doing like 25 flights a week, we're up to 38 now and we're adding more tomorrow. We've done 560 of these flights to, to date, over 10 million kilos. 
So, you know, right now, I mean, I can let Helen add, but we're, we're just trying to keep up and again, add where the capacity is. Yeah, the only other thing that I would add is traffic rights start to come into play here. Um, you know, we, we don't have traffic rights to fly directly from the US to Vietnam. Um, so that, that is also going to play into our response. And we have relied on people like Sean to help us with interline agreements to move things by other ports in Asia. And that, that just isn't there right now because the, 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 the capacity is complete, completely eaten up by the PPE. And, and, and that's, a, that's a really good point. I, I don't think people really understand the complexity of the air freight supply chain. And, and as Helen mentioned, the interlines, we do a lot of business with, with United and other airlines where they may fly one sector in a place we're not operating, and then we pick it up and we'll fly the second sector for it. So a lot of your air freight and PPE and other things, they're moving because we're cooperating together as airlines in order to create that solution that, that one of us alone would have difficulty doing. So uh, what, one, one uh, comment, uh, Sean, related to this, to the same question, if we remove the PPE um, demand, air freight demand, how would we be doing now as a freighter operator? Yeah, and if we weren't moving the PPE, the demand is not there because the manufacturing is closed. Our product moves because manufacturing is, is doing their job, they're producing product, it's shipping. So one leads to the other. If factories are not operating, then the need for air freight is not going to be there. That's the reason we exist. Other than, as Helen mentioned, some perishable trades and things that we, that we do, it wouldn't support the whole industry. So uh, the fact that the factories have shut down has created the need for this alternate, the PPE, so that the factories can get back into business. Good point. Uh, Courtney Robinson uh, from ICAO has the following question for you all, and it's related to what you've all talked about uh, taking care of your crews. Um, he indicates, he said, ICAO has asked governments to exercise flexibility on rules regulating transport of crews, um, curfews, slot amendments, uh, et cetera. How, how has, uh, how effective has this implementation been? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think for us, it's actually been very good. Once it was raised to the attention of the government that the measures they put in, put in place to keep their people safe were, prohi were prohibiting us from operating, they were pretty quick to work with us. Um, for instance, some of the things that we do in, in Asian cities is we use dedicated transport for our crews between the hotel and the airport. They don't use public transportation. Um, once they're in the hotel, they agree not to leave the hotel. We have food brought in to them. So uh, we've created some agreements with the local uh, cities where we're going to try to isolate our crews as much as they can. Our crews want to be isolated. They don't want to be wandering around out there either. So it's kind of a, a mutual understanding of, of how we now operate, especially in the Asian cities, to make sure that we keep our crews safe uh, and Typically the hotels are helping us, the ground transport uh, groups are helping us in order to ensure that, that we can continue to operate safely. I would say there's also been some cooperation in the industry. Uh, when you look at the pilot group, a uh, number of them are unionized. They belong to ALPA or APA or, or other organizations. And in many cases, those organizations have also made sure that they're working together and it, it, you know, an airline and a, an integrator, for instance, might use the same hotel and the same types of procedures so that they can strictly adhere to keeping uh, the social distance, more than a social distancing, let's call it an isolation, um, to keep our crews safe the whole time that they are in transit for us. Honey, I have a few. Mark, uh, sorry, uh, Mark, did you want to address that as well? Um, I, th I think we're good. Okay. Honey, there are a few more questions I can get to here, but is there anything that you want to ask at this point yourself? Well, why don't you go ahead with your questions for now? Okay. Uh, this question is uh, targeted towards United. The question is relating to all of your operations people. And the question is, uh, you know, dispatchers, meteorologists, flight planning, et cetera. Um, how are they operating these days with uh, a lot of us working uh, through the work at home model? 
Yeah, so our our operations center, they're, I think they're doing a hybrid now, and, and I apologize, I'm not as, as really close to this, but I know, as you know, they're all up in Willis Tower on, on one floor, and there's a, there's a... Oh, Mark, you still there? All right. <laughs> if, if he... <laughs> if doing, uh, patterns of work to be able to separate people as well, but, uh, you know, obviously, following strict uh, sanitizing and, and those types of things as well. But um, they, they are allowing some putting, looking at ways to be more creative and use a, a, for lack of a better term, walkie-talkie type system to be able to communicate because it, because it is, is real time. So a combination of all of those things to be able to work. I do know I, I did go out there one evening to pick something up from the office and you know everybody I think is temperature checked uh, on the way up. Uh, in, into this area. So a, a lot of precautions taken with this group, a lot of backup plans, continuity plans, and, and just being uh, extra safe and careful. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Okay, um, I've got another question, but before I do that, I'm just gonna interject and say that uh, there's one commenter, uh, Glenn Hughes from IATA, who just wants to congratulate all of you. <laughs> Um, and your teams are doing such a fantastic job during these very difficult and challenging times. So it's always nice to get a shout out from the community that recognizes what you're all working on. Um, we had a couple of questions related to oil prices. And the question is, um, uh, <clears throat> what have you been able to do to leverage uh, maybe a worldwide lowering of oil prices, maybe helping to uh, address uh, hedging fuel contracts? if any of you are involved with those activities? At, at United, we have not hedged for a number of years. So for us right now, we are able to take advantage of the lower oil prices or lower fuel prices. So I think we're, for us, it's a good thing right now, uh, but we had made an active decision a number of years ago to go away from the hedges. I, I would add to that in, in maybe a little direct is I think that's fairly low on our priority list right now. And it's about, you know, conserving cash. It's about the ongoing business. It's about keeping the employees safe and those types of things. It is an added benefit, you know, obviously, and for the flights that we are able to run to run. But I, I just think, it, you know, I'm not involved directly in this area, but I think it's, it's fairly low on the priority list for us. There's a lot more important things that we need to get through. At NCA, we do hedge fuel a percentage, um, somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. So obviously, you know, when you hedge fuel and the price drops, uh, those hedges actually cost you money. So um, it's an insurance policy that we take out. That's the way we view it. Um, it's a portion of our fuel. It's not all of our fuel. It's it's usually less than half. Um, so you know, it, it is what it is. And we're hedged out usually two years at a time by quarter. Um, I'm sure our fuel hedge team is out there looking at it now to, to figure out what we do going forward, but that's my extent of uh, fuel hedging knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> Lawrence Audenard from MITRE uh, has the following question, and uh, Jared, I'm going to steer it towards you first. If uh, you want to uh, take a shot at answering them, we'll go to United and, and also um, Sean. But he says, we've heard from some of our, uh, the NUTC previous talks, about stockpiling of goods, either by reduced consumption or a slowdown of links in the supply chain network. Is air freight also seeing backup downstream or are the goods shifting to air transportation mode in high enough demand that you're not, that this isn't an issue that you're seeing? I, I, I would defer to, to the other guys, but I don't, I don't really see that you know, right now, like Sean said, supply has stopped um, and production has stopped. So, um, you know, I, I think we still haven't felt the shortages because uh, our, our supply chain may be 45 days out, but there will be come a time. So it could be that we don't feel it because we, our flights start to go back up um, as, we, as we move forward uh, and, and China opens up. But um, beyond that, I don't really have anything else to add. Done. Um, yeah, I, I can tell you what we see as a freighter operator, uh, a lot of our business, especially U.S. export, is project related. So we have large 
lots that move as a project to, to something happening in Asia. What our customers are telling us is they've been told, hold all the projects. Don't send them to Asia because once they get there, they're not ready for them now anyway. So they typically time those movements closer to when they're needed. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a bit of a backlog because they're holding them. Um, once manufacturing opens back up in Asia, I think you will see a strong demand to move this product. But in the meantime, our customers are saying, uh, hold, hold, hold it at origin, don't move it through. I would say from the United side, I haven't uh, heard of anything in terms of the stockpiling. We do get backlogs in places because we uh, people tender more than we expected, but uh, we're, we're not a storage facility for anything at this point. I, I would agree. We're not that close to it. I, I'm not seeing this, which I think is a good thing. I mean, the biggest problem we have is we have masks, you know, in Asia that we need to get here and it's getting the proper approvals to be able to bring them here. That's the, that's the biggest problems we see. I, I'm not seeing any, any incidents of this. So one, one follow up comment. I mean, it, don't, don't we think that after this crisis is over that, that, you know, hospitals to the strategic supply of the U S is going to, start to hoard some of this, these products that are being made outside because uh, the KN95 masks were an issue, right? Um, and we, we saw, we painfully saw what that feels like um, and crippled our hospitals. So I would say that at some point that would start to happen, um, not at our level, but, but at the you know, hospital or the critical supply chain of, of or the critical supply of the U.S. Well, that's, I think that's why we mentioned, you know, in our response where, where Jan had mentioned, we, we expect to be able to get back up to speed very, very quickly and be, be ahead of the passenger side. And we're, we're planning accordingly because they're, they're going to fill that void in the, in the supply chain. But, you know, e even the non-logistics part of this, I mean, everybody's financial stress tests are going to completely change, right? People use 9-11 before, so that's going to change. But um, we, we have talked about manufacturing more goods in the United States, so you might see the flows a little bit differently as well. Um, and you're also going to see those types of things, Jared, that you mentioned, where, where uh, people are going to try to build up supplies of these as quickly as possible. Because, you know, we do have some talk of things potentially happening in the fall again, and I think everybody's going to want to make sure that they're prepared. So I think all, all of those comments are fair game. Yeah. I, I'm Canadian and I, I would like to comment on one thing and that was after SARS. Uh, Canada has very strong population from Hong Kong and Canada was especially hard hit with SARS. And one of the things the Canadian government did was they stockpiled masks. Uh, that, that was a, a key initiative that came out of SARS. But when this all started, Canada found themselves short because there was no plan to cycle those masks through the, the supply chain, if you will. And so all of them had expired. And that's why Canada had to go out and get masks as well. Even though they had a stockpile of several million, they, didn't, they couldn't use them. So I'd, I'd like to ask a question. Um, in terms of, of course, most of our discussion has been about an, um, international uh, air cargo. Um, what about the domestic side? And I know that's probably not Sean's uh, sort of um, main focus. Uh, of course, on the domestic side, you can always send things by truck uh, for, for, many, for many origins and destinations and many markets. What has been happening with, with domestic air cargo? Yeah, I mean, it's ironic that you ask because we just had a, we had a conference call yesterday where we're looking at where we're, we're asked to be in truck longer distances. So where we usually would truck between San Francisco and LA and then, you know, in a 500 mile radius around Chicago or Houston or Dulles or New York. Uh, we, we do, the longest we do is from Newark and Dulles where we truck, truck down to it, Atlanta or that, that part of the world. Mm -hmm. But the requests have been coming in for longer distances. So as we say, mid-con and maybe even trans-con coast to coast. So one of the things we're looking at as, as we look at passenger aircraft side again is can, can some of these be upgaged? And can we put a wide body in this mid-con and trans-con traffic? And then, and then one of the things that goes into the financial analysis is not only the, obviously the delta between the costs of the narrow body to wide body and so forth, but also what are the truck costs that you would save? And then also 
if, if you can be uh, deliver these goods quicker, is there a yield improvement, those types of things. So that's exactly the work that's going on right now. So I think it's a very appropriate question and, and that's being reviewed right now. Again, as with everything, with, with the focus on cash, you know, you need to make sure that it's, it's the right business decision, but that, that exact, uh, that exact uh, business work is going on right now. So I had a follow-up question on the field for Mark. Mm -hmm. um, so you think if the pricing of fuel wouldn't be so discounted at the moment, would United still engage in, in cargo flights? Yeah, absolutely. The, I mean, you, you, if you remember, again, and Sean's probably going to smile because I think he made a comment on it, but if you're looking at full cost or variable cost and, and how you're and how you're looking at these. Remember with the CARES Act that came in, there's a lot of sunk cost right now. So it's, if, if you factor that and you just look at your incremental cost to be able to do some of these things and can you make a margin? And uh, without, without giving the numbers, I can tell you that it's incredible that it, absolutely 100% that that's the case. Honey, we're coming up on five. I didn't know if you wanted to have a Final question. I do have a final one more. question, but if you have anything good on your on your side you want to ask? Well, I wanted to ask one from one of our graduate students, Lama Hassan, who wanted to know from United, um, what are the barriers to the, to the conversion of passenger aircraft, if you're doing any of that to cargo? And is it mainly a cost issue? And if it is, what is the main cost component to do it, to make that conversion? Yeah, very, very good question, looking at as well, and that's what I mentioned, how we're way busier than we ever were before because of all of these types of things. But, you know, as I mentioned, it was immediately putting cargo in the bins, and it, and it just sounds easy because you see, you know, that they would do it in China or, or some places, and, and you don't realize that there's an issue with, with lithium batteries and dangerous goods and, and those types of things, and what product would you put in there? There's, do you have equipment to be able to load the doors, to be able to load this in there? How long does it take? you know, all of those types of questions come up. Then it's a completely different question when you look at putting cargo in the cabin, whether you're putting them in seat, you guys have all seen the pictures or without. You gotta remember there's oxygen masks above all the seats and that's an accelerant, right? If, if there were some kind of fire. So, you know, now you have crew members in, you know, being able to, to potentially fight these fires and so forth. So it, it brings all kinds of other issues. You know, so then it, I'm just getting into the complexity of it a little bit here, but you know, there's talk of shutting off that oxygen. Well, then if you have deadheading crews, then you know, if there's an issue, they need to have a, so you see it, it just keeps going. And, and these are the, the conference calls and with, with the different governmental agencies to be able to do this. So we, we do have a project, you know, we are looking at that. We are looking at potential for combis and removing seats, but I just hit on, on some of the issues there's a tremendous amount that, that you wouldn't even think of that comes into this. Again, uh, Sean and his team, this is, this is what they do. It, it's not what we do. They've already gone through all the safety and risk assessments and so forth. Uh, uh, two or three times a week, we have safety risk assessment meetings on how to be able to mitigate this. There's FAA meetings every single day. And it, it's, there is a, a, a ton of barriers to be able to do this when you haven't done it on a regular basis. And it's a lot more work and a lot more things than I would have ever thought of are involved in making this kind of switch. That, that's, that's really all I can say from that perspective. Yeah, the, the only thing that I would add is keep in mind, you know, we're a passenger airline primarily, and we, we operate under uh, certificates that are set by the FAA. Uh, we're one of many carriers in the United States that operate under the FAA and safety is the primary concern for the passenger and for the crew. So what Mark touched on here, if, if we were to convert an aircraft and say, okay, let's, let's pull out all the seats, let's, let's strip that aircraft, it means you're taking the bins out, you're taking the oxygen out. It means truly converting an aircraft and, and that is expensive and it, it's, it's not our core business. We, we do want to remain a passenger carrier too. So I don't think we're ready to make the leap yet and the hurdles are high. Indeed. So I have a question, and maybe this is our, our uh, final question here, but I spoke to, uh, to all of you, uh, it was really more than a week ago when, when we spoke, 
And uh, things are changing. Uh, things are changing rather rapidly. And of course, you've all demonstrated, again, the ability to be dynamic and, and, and sort of roll with, with the punches as things unfold. How would you say things are different, even in this, you know, in the week or 10 days since we last spoke? Uh, I know there was, uh, uh, you know, all of you mentioned that there, and certainly from a demand for uh, air cargo, that there was, uh, you know, quite a bit of, of, an, of a surge of an increase. Are we still there? Or is this uh, kind of beginning to, to guide a little bit? Uh, um, and I certainly I know from Jared's standpoint, because of not, not having all the uh, passenger flights and, and cargo in their bellies, there there's a lot less to, to, to process and handle. But in terms of the demand for sort of for cargo uh, in general, uh, are we still with that kind of big surge that we were seeing? I mean, you all of you have mentioned about capacity being tight and so on. Can you just comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I can jump in first here. Maybe, you know, I mentioned we continue to add flights. I mentioned we went from 25 last week up to 38, and we're, and we're adding more tomorrow, and Helen can touch on it a little bit. But we have that that body of work that just continues to grow. Mm -hmm. I mentioned we're looking at the creativity, shouldn't be able to move to the bed soon, and then it's, it's possible to put to put in seats. Uh, and we will at least look and do the business case on, on Combi. So all that is parallel work going on. What's changed a little bit, and I won't say it's really a pivot, but uh, what we have also in our spare time has started looking at what's next. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in May, June, and July when flights start coming back, and we have uh, all kinds of scenario planning going on and, and how you ramp up. What does the team look like? Uh, where are they located? How are they working together? And then, and then past you know September 30th and you know October and the rest of the year, how does it look? And because nobody really knows what the demand for, for air travel is going to be. So we've just added that. That would be the big change that I would add that, that we've added into our, our work scope is, mm -hmm. is that scenario planning as well. Uh, Jared, anything on your side? Oh, I'll, I'll leave it to the, to the big guys over here. Sean? <laughs> Uh, yeah, J Jared's being modest there. Um, those guys at AGI and his team have really done a great job. What we've figured out over the last really two to three weeks is how to work in this environment, how to put the safety measures in place. And his team, you know, Jared provides most of my handling at uh, Chicago and LA, our two biggest locations. And his team has really stepped up and helped us figure out the guidelines in order to operate safe, help us track the issues. That kind of cooperation and, and, and uh, partnership that we have with these guys, really, we've gotten so much better at it. We had a recent incident this week that happened at a different location. And instead of having to reinvent, we knew exactly what to do. We knew how to attack it. We knew how to contain it. Uh, two weeks ago, we were still trying to figure it out. So, you know, everybody working together in this industry, we've, we've really shared a lot of that information. I think it's, it's helped us to learn how to operate in this environment safely. Thank you. Helen, uh, final word? I would only say that new markets continue to pop up. The, the you know, demand is still through the roof out of China, but now we're hearing from other countries too that have a desperate need. And as those needs arise, we keep just trying to find more planes and more crews and ways to help uh, fill that void and be able to move the, the, the needed goods. Well, then um, I'd like one, to... Uh, one comment here, honey. Oh, there's um, another comment here. Go ahead. So, honey, uh, the one yeah. thing I wanted to say is, you know, I always try to find something positive no matter how terrible the situation is. There has never been a better time to be in cargo and air cargo, <laughs> right? We're so, all of a sudden, we're more appreciated than ever before. <laughs> um, you know, I, I could tell you, for example, for United that's on here, you know, normally cargo is always the ancillary revenue uh, small guys, uh, and yeah, they're around in the back corner. Uh, today, they're appreciated immensely. So, so you know, that's the that's the silver, silver lining. Yeah. Jared, you're you're so. What what is humorous is I talk to other people who are bored out of their skulls. They've been binging Netflix. They haven't gotten off of the couch, and I'm like, wow, really? I haven't turned the television set on in weeks. That's right. Well, on this note, then, please uh, let me 
thank you all for making the time. Uh, I, I know, again, how, how, how busy you all are. Uh, thank you so much for making time, sharing your experiences, your insights, and uh, really uh, helping us understand what has been happening uh, in terms of air cargo and how that is all impacting sub supply chains uh, and these uh, really unusual uh, circumstances. So uh, thanks again. And to our audience, thank you for being with us. Uh, next week, we will be talking about uh, third-party logistics uh, providers uh, and uh, you know their contribution to the resilience of our supply chains. So uh, stay with us um, again with this series. Um, and uh, we hope to see you again next week. Thank you very much. Right. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you guys. Good seeing you too. <laughs>